with ACLs and user authentication, it only makes us wonder the future of these two hard questions. Uh, who are you and what do you have access to? And I think with that, I'm going to hand it over to Andrew for this week's grab bag topic. Yeah, so this, this week's grab bag topic, uh, is, as Jack was alluding to, is is all kind of wrapped up in, you know, the essence of what is the future tech, you know, that that we've all been hearing about. Um, so so the, the title here is Neil Stevenson's Metaverse is not a use case for NFTs. Uh, so I, I guess I wanted to start off with, you know, Jack, what's what's your hot take of, of NFTs, right? And, and really, have you read any of Neil Stevenson's work? I have read Snow Crash. Okay. Uh, I my take on NFTs is they're kind of BS. <laughs> uh, well, they're at, complicated. At, we can at this uh, point think, in time. Um, I think I don't think, and I think the reason I say they're BS at this point is because art isn't a great format for them now. Non fungible tokens on their own, I think, is going to be a good idea. I just don't think art is right for it. It's that's that's a very nuanced answer to a very difficult question. So yeah, no thanks, thanks for that. Um, Snow Crash, as you mentioned, uh, being one of Neil Stevenson's work, uh, actually the the one that really cemented him uh, as a major science fiction writer. Um, it, it actually, I, I have a little, little factoid here. It appeared on Time Magazine's list of 100 all-time best English language novels written since 1928. So in in almost 100 years, or 1923, excuse me, in almost 100 years, uh, that that's it's it's still among the top 100. In, in you know, what is this book that has stood the test of time so well? Um, the, the synopsis of the book goes, In the not-too-distant future, a world where the mafia controls pizza delivery, the United States exists as a patchwork of corporate franchise city-states, and the internet, incarnate as the metaverse, looks something like last year's hype would lead you to believe it should. Uh, so, obviously, we want to start talking about the metaverse because there has been all this rumbling about Facebook's metaverse, and I wanted to see how NFTs kind of fit into that, right? So, to, to continue uh, on the background of this book, um, they go on, In reality, Hero Protagonist, and yes, that is the name of the main character of the book, Hero Protagonist, delivers pizza for Casa Nostra. But in the metaverse, he's a warrior prince, last of the solo hackers, and the greatest sword fighter in the world. Now he's racing along the neon-lit streets, the skirts of his black leather kimono flapping, on a search-and-destroy mission for the shadowy virtual villain threatening to bring about infopocalypse. When his best friend fries his brain on a new designer drug called Snow Crash, and his beautiful brainy ex-girlfriend asks for his help, what's a guy... With a name like that to do, he rushes to the rescue. So it's a it's a great book. Trust me. Is this? I, I think the summary was very well written. Um, it's it is a, a almost a parody to to some level of other kind of hacker type stories. Like the, they they uh, Neil steals a lot of different tropes and uh, really greatly exaggerates the whole, you know, villain, uh, hero villain motif. Uh, and, and it's just it's just very enjoyable to read. Um, a, a couple of things I wanted to highlight out of this uh, is that similar to Cyberpunk, or some have called it Cyberbug 2077, uh, most territory is owned by private organizations and entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know if you've heard the rumbling, but there's a lot about, you know, secessionism and Amazon, you know, creating its own cities. And, you know, so, so you're starting to hear kind of rumblings of that. So that, that was a red flag to me. And I was like, well, I, I think I've heard of this before. Um, the main character is hero protagonist, uh, who, like he said, is a, is a pizza delivery boy by day and the originator of the metaverse by night. So the, the metaverse was the other big thing, uh, that, that has been in the news lately. And, and we'll touch on that in a second. Um, his, his task obviously is to, to find the origins of the virus and stop the evil men from using it for the evil. Like I said, it's very uh, big on the tropes here. The, the the 
kind of meta parts of it that are interesting to me besides the whole like they go into different you know sumerian language and texts and you know have text and be written as code and like override the bios of the human wetware brain and so 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 it's it's very it's very science fictiony to the point where it's almost nauseating but still enjoyable uh the 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 interesting part comes in, in in two bits here. The first being economics. So uh, I, I just pulled this from Wikipedia because I think it's a great synopsis. But they go, uh, hyperinflation has sapped the value of the U.S. dollar to the extent that trillion dollar bills are nearly disregarded. And quadrillion dollar note, nicknamed the Gipper, is the small standard kind of bill, like a, like a $20, $20 bill nowadays. This hyperinflation was caused by the government overprinting money, anyone hear that before, due to loss of tax revenue as people increasingly began using electronic currency, wink wink, which they exchanged in untaxable encrypted online transactions, um, for which Ross Ulbricht is still in jail. For physical transactions, most people resort to alternate currencies such as yen or Kong bucks, the official currency of Mr. Lee's Greater Hong Kong, once again, privately owned territory there. Uh, hyperinflation has also negatively affected much of the rest of the world, uh, resulting in waves of def- desperate refugees from Asia who cross the Pacific in rickety ships hoping to arrive in North America. So you have a lot of things that, that parallel, you know, kind of, hinting at what we've been seeing lately um especially uh like the electronic currency this was written in the 90s so i mean there was no such thing as bitcoin hash cash was still kind of like a a, a a thought at that point so you have to say all right how you know how, what what kind of led him to to this place and and what can we learn from this um and then he starts to describe his version of the metaverse and this this has been plagiarized almost everywhere throughout the internet history like this is this is the canonical description of like a vr utopia right this is this is a total immersion i'm gonna go in uh, you know into the matrix and everything that happens in the matrix happens for real kind of thing and you know so so this is kind of where all of those tropes started um so he he coined this phrase um he says it's a successor to the ins uh, the internet, uh, and it really constitutes his vision of how a reality-based internet might evolve in the near future. Um, so talking about it here, uh, it resembles a massive multiplayer online game. The metaverse is populated by user-controlled avatars, as well as system demons. Uh, and I didn't know that avatar as a like computer like representation of yourself yeah. was really popularized with this book as well. So, I mean, this kicked off a lot of different things. This, this is why it was in the top 100 books in the past or yeah, in the past almost a hundred years now. Um, so although there are public access metaverse terminals in reality, using them carries a social stigma among metaverse denizens in part because of the low visual representations of themselves, such as low quality avatars and here's uh, an important thing here. Status in the metaverse is a function of two things. Access to restricted environments, such as the Black Sun, which is like a nightclub, virtual nightclub. Um, and te- technical acumen, which is often demonstrated by the sophistication of one's avatar. Uh, so it's it's somewhat of a meritocracy kind of merged with a relationship driven hierarchy as as kind of any social um, network would be. Uh, now, what was interesting to me is that Ready Player One also popularized this idea of the metaverse um, in a similar type of you know everything's going to crap you know everyone's isolated from each other you know every you know people are having a hard time connecting and social problems are rampant e- economic stagnation is happening you know the, all these bad things right uh, they say here the primary escape for most people in in Ready Player One is a virtual universe called the Oasis which is accessed with a visor and haptic glove so once again we're talking about like a full kind of immersion. Um, it functions both as an MMORPG and as a virtual society, with its currency being the most stable currency in the world, right? And, you know, Bitcoin maxis could only hope that be the case for them. So 
we have here two kind of representations. One is is like the, the, the canon, right? This is where it kind of it all originated. And then in Ready Player One, they also describe a, a metaverse type scenario. And I think that came out, what, 2018, 2019, something like that? The movie, the movie did, yeah, One? the movie was yeah, pretty Yeah, the recent. book came out in 20, 2011, yeah. Um, but we go back into, you know, Facebook having changed its name to Meta. And why did it do that? Well, it wanted to kind of create the metaverse. What is the metaverse? Well, I, I, I've tried to lay that out for you here. So we have an understanding of what the metaverse is. Uh, what are some other implementations of metaverses? Metaverses? Whatever. That have already come to fruition. Well, the first one, IMVU, we actually talked about back in episode 11 when we were talking about the Lean Startup. A lot of their examples... Uh, Eric Ries's examples was pulled from uh, his experience at IMVU, grabbing customer feedback and doing iterative processes, releasing early and often, yada, yada, yada. So there is a lot of, of metaverse um, history online. I mean, I think IMVU was released in like 2004, right? And it is it is as simple as you go create your online avatar, go shopping in your online avatar, do meet people, have conversations, do stuff as your online avatar, right? I mean, this is, it functions basically as an MMORPG, right? Sure. Um, and, and I would say it's, it's similar to an MMORPG. Uh, in, in fact, that probably that's the best way to think about it, except for the fact that there's no like war or fighting component to it it's more just like social life rather than you know kind of like a medieval struggle with demons and villains right you know littered around the world right so it's it's still just like on a server you're logging into a server you know in a world and people are like walking around socializing it's like, yeah 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 you're, you're simply just socializing uh another popular one is second life so that's yeah. been around uh forever as well um, and then obviously Facebook's metaverse uh, that they just came up with. Now, if you think about those three that I just outlined, right, that isn't something that's universal, not something that's decentralized. It bears almost no resemblance to the cyberpunk culture or the decentralization push, uh, that comes with, you know, blockchain and cryptocurrency and, and all this kind of, uh, privacy focused tech that's really taken the spotlight since call it the Snowden revelations, right? So how does this fit into NFTs? Well, we understand that these companies want to utilize NFTs some way, but first we have to kind of understand what NFTs are. Um, and one of the uh, phrases that gets bandied about uh, is, aren't they basically just JPEGs that you can right-click and save, right? <laughs> yes, but... <laughs> <you know>. Right. <laughs> yes, but... Uh, and and there's a there's a lot to go in. Um, it, it's in, And I have a lot of notes here, so I don't know how much I'm going to be able to touch on, but I did want to highlight a couple things. So So one of the things is are NFTs stored on chain? And it's the same answer. It's it's yes, but, right? So not all NFTs are stored in the same way. One of the main features of NFTs is their provable ownership, verifiability, and provenance. As we know, this is achieved by creating NFTs on decentralized blockchains, such so as Ethereum. But here comes a problem. Although these beautiful high resolution pictures, if we're just talking about, you know, JPEGs sure. of apes or penguins are cool, there's no way the image files representing them can be stored on the blockchain itself. This leads to a situation where most NFTs only include a link to the actual art and its metadata, which is then stored off chain. There's a whole range of options when storing data off chain. Some projects use centralized servers, other try to improve the situation by uploading their metadata and art to IPFS. Other solutions like Arweaver are also gaining traction. Uh, generative art and certain low resolution NFTs are some of the exceptions here as they can be entirely stored on chain. Uh, so that is from a, um, oh, who's that by? 
uh, Finematic um, video. So that is a YouTube channel that goes through a lot of NFTs, DeFi, blockchain. Uh, they do kind of like little explainer videos. And that's probably the most uh, concise uh, description of the issue with where is this NFT actually stored. And, and, and the answer really is unless you're part of the exceptions, which proves the rule, the rule being that the NFTs are stored off chain. So you come back and, you know, all right, cool. What, what is actually alluring about these, right, by the way? Well, one of the, the things that is, is proposed is that you can prove ownership of these things, right? And, sure. and proving ownership is a very loaded phrase. Like, what does ownership mean? You know, what, what does prove mean? Right. And, and, and then you really have to get deep into what this is. And, and um, then we get into, like, what is their use, Right. Uh, what you know, what how can you show it off? You know, if we, we go back to Neil Stevenson's metaverse. Right. One of the things that was tied with status was kind of their their avatar, which right. really did reflect back on their technical acumen. Um, but still, I mean, owning a owning a, an NFT does give you some kind of props in or, you know, some some legitimacy uh, in, in the crypto sphere. Right. So. Uh, what people come up with is profile picture NFTs or, or PFP NFTs. P PFP just meaning profile, profile picture. picture right? sure. It's not it's not that complicated. But uh, a lot of people have used that profile picture everywhere they are online. So in in Telegram, in WhatsApp, in Signal, in Twitter, in you know Mastodon, wherever they're going to use this PFP NFT as their profile picture, right? Um, and, and then we come back to, while this is great and all, can't people just save your image and use it as their Twitter profile picture? Well, yes, they can. <laughs> <laughs> but since NFTs are on the blockchain, it's easy to prove who's the original owner. And here's where it gets interesting. Uh, and this is from PFP NFTs, all you need to know um, from Airdrop Alert. And they say, moreover, Twitter developers announced that they are working on a verification tool so Twitter can verify ownership of the NFT. The owner will get a small Ethereum logo on their PFP, similar to the blue checkmark icon that influencers have. Hmm. Okay. How about that? What if your PFP isn't owned on Ethereum? What if you own this somewhere else? You know, not on Twitter, right? How do you verify it other places? And what what if you've what if you've chosen to host the metadata and image somewhere else and 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 that's what information is in the blockchain right if it's not in one of twitter's approved registrars right at this point you're like wait a second so i have a centralized developer mental you know monitoring a centralized service requiring centralized authentication tools to prove my decentralized ownership of a copyable image I'm like, how many more hoops do we have to jump through before we're legally declared a surf circus? Like this, <laughs> this is getting a little ridiculous, right? So, so to bring it all together, if we think of the metaverse, metaverse in St in, in Neil Stevenson's vision is this kind of federated place where everything kind of is is fair game right except for the societies in which you choose to operate right you, you can you can slice it up as much as you want but if you can't hack your way in or if you're not granted privilege in you're 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 not getting in there right um what kind of works universally and and he answers that question in a in a hacker type way in in a way that you know only people I've allowed in can get in or, you know, we've we've granted this only to a specific number of users. But it's not like that loses all of its impetus once you go outside the realm of whatever. This is, you know, anything that needs to operate on the blockchain needs to operate in the real world, too. Right. So so how do we get from NFTs are literally copy and pasteable and only enforceable inside of centralized environments to something that's actually feasible to to function as a non-fungible token. It's something that provides non-fungibility. 
so I copied a lot from uh, let's see expensitivity.com I've never been there before but wow was this an amazingly good write up like blew, blew me away how in depth and considered this was so props to them for doing this actually who's Who's, who's the author? Who's the author? Because they did a really, really good job. I mean, I was glued to my screen for like 20 minutes reading and rereading this. Uh, Bernard Fixer did a great job. Um, so he has a lot more to say than I'm going to be able to touch on right now. Uh, but a couple things I wanted to pull out of his article. He actually goes through how to make an NFT on eBay. And he kind of, it's, it's tongue in cheek because at the end of it, you've created an NFT, which is a non-fungible token without the use of any kind of blockchain whatsoever, right? Which is his entire argument in the first place. And, and I don't disagree with him, but if we, we come back to this, this idea of having a social digital marketplace, right? Having this ecosystem built around it, how, how can this work or, or will it, right? So we have to say, uh, he brings up the which blockchain question, which we already go through. Um, he starts talking about uh, Jack Dorsey's first tweet on Twitter, right? The, pr uh, the previous CEO of Twitter. Uh, he says, we have no technological guarantees that Dorsey's Genesis tweet will not be retokenized by him as an NFT. Sure. Instead, the only constraint on pro proliferation is Dorsey's promise not to do otherwise and the social norms that would hold him to that promise. He's already sold one. What is to prevent him from selling another or, or retokenizing it? Nothing. There is no technological guarantee. We talk about the blockchain. You know, we, we now have an immutable ledger that extends back in time. That's a technological guarantee. That is a cryptographically secure guarantee. We don't have that same kind of guarantee for any of these NFTs being minted. And it's like you said, uh, it, it can just be retokenized. Yeah. Same picture or same, same content. Same picture. Whatever you want to make it. Or on a different blockchain. Right. Or or on a different server. I mean, it, there's, or under a different minting company. Because there are companies who will do this for you and then say, no, 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 you can't update, you can't upload it again. All right, well, I'll go to Joe Somewhere Schmo's else. printing Down the street. Minting yeah. office. Yeah. And, and, and have him tokenize it for me. Because he's got no moral constraints. He's a... He's a shady character, uh, so it, there's there's no technical technological guarantees uh, on on any on any fungibility or not fungibility, but any you know scarcity for these NFTs. Um, let's see. So he, he he had he had a couple good examples. One of them uh, revolved around uh, a, a digital photo. And different ways to trade that. Um, he was talking about copyright, and you know what, what can be claimed uh, with an NFT. Uh, and it turns out if you don't have a social institution around it, or like copyright law, right, you're not going to be able to claim anything with it. It, you know, it it doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything. Uh, I think he said. Uh, he was giving a, a hypothetical situation where he he just kind of reprinted um, this this image that he had, right? Um, he said, having saturated Rarible, which is one of these kind of vendors who will mint NFTs for you, with my NFT of the Iowa Democratic primary, I could go to any other NFT marketplace that requires no prior approval of its users and do the same exercise there, uploading the PNG of the Iowa Democratic primary there as an NFT. Granted, word of my unbridled proliferation of the same NFT might get around and ruin any chance of turning a profit with it, but that's not the point, right? He said the point is that with such unbridled proliferation, with its assault on scarcity, it has no technological solution, right? As a consequence, all the actual content of an NFT, in other words, what makes it collectible, artworthy, or of any interest, will typically reside off the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and this is kind of diving into more of these, these minting companies, right? Um, he said, but where? Well, in the case of the NFT I created at Rarible, it will reside at Rarible, 
with what's on the Ethereum blockchain simply registering the NFT and pointing to Rarible for the PNG that's at the heart of this NFT. And he made a good point here, right? He said, so my NFT to exist at all must reside in two places, namely the Ethereum blockchain and the Rarible website. If either fails, I lose my NFT. This is this is something that's just not secure, right? Right? It's not tech. How many companies did we see go under in the dot com bust, right? You know, when 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 all of that took a downturn, you know how many companies are are still around today? Not not many, right? Not many. What what happens if there's another, right? What happens if anything happens, right? You you don't have a resiliency system. That has been, trust me, probed to death, uh, like blockchain technology, right? The the amount of world-ending scenarios that I have seen postulated online where the main concern of the asker is, will I still have my Bitcoin? I'm like, dude, you, you, you better be <laughs> happy you still have both your arms at that point. <laughs> man and 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 the answer typically is yes there's a way to kind of consolidate all of that at the end of the day were everything to you know spontaneously return to normal i i don't see any type of guarantees like that from nfts not in the least he says for one uh, so getting get into the the very last section of this, um, you know, talking about talking about we're, we're not giving the same guarantees as as with stuff on the blockchain. He kind of goes into well, why then do we need a blockchain at all? And he gives a hypothetical. Oh, actually, a, a real world scenario. I think it was like the most NF, expensive NFT ever sold. It was like a. a montage not montage but um mosaic of different pictures put together uh and and he's t here talking about the uh, exchange of that you know signed over to um Sundarasan, um who was the the investor who who bought it from um christie's being the the auction house uh christie's of that nft so he said that it was signed over to him on the ethereum blockchain or any blockchain for that matter seems unessential. Christie's and Sundarison, for instance, could have set up a private public cryptography key for themselves, and Christie's could have then signed over every days, the image every days, from its key to the purchaser. The public keys and the signing of the artwork using private keys would have been noted far and wide, given all the public attention to this sale, and the purchaser could have paid for it in any currency mutually agreed upon by the buyer and the auction house. Blockchain could thus have been sidelined. And he finishes up with yeah. this. Ownership on the Ethereum blockchain is not ownership in the real world. Real world ownership is ownership with the force of law behind it. Ethereum blockchain based ownership is purely conventional ownership. It only applies within the Ethereum ecosystem and nowhere outside. To conclude, I think I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, and and this, is, this is my take. My take is that NFTs are legitimized to the extent that their utilization is confined to a socially defined ecosystem whose rules are centrally enforced. And if you go back to any functioning representation of any kind of metaverse or, or any kind of real universe, that's never going to be a sustainable case for anything. The, the universe is subject to entropy and decay and, and rust, as I found out on my car. And, and it's just not a place that is is going to be kind to these things that are so flighty and and so error prone and you need real assurity and we, and we look we look everywhere for that kind of assurity we're, we're, we're risk adverse right and there's there's many reasons why why we are 
but the thought is if if we can if we can contribute and we can be a part of something sustainable something bigger than us something that could outlive us right then that may be something worth investing time in investing money in investing energy in and you know putting together our compose i i looked out on the landscape and i said look the applications that i'm interested in have been around yeah for a long time and i have no doubt that they will continue to be around far after i have either outgrown them or they have outlived me whatever happens first uh, and and in, in seeking for this you know what what can we do to be a part of something bigger than ourselves how can we contribute to something bigger than ourselves right that is core that is fundamental to the mission of what we're doing here at our compose right so if that's something you believe in right you you should you should well you should be way beyond signing up for the mailing list uh, by that point right right this should be something you should be giving us a call about you know how how do i get myself on this kind of sustainability wave right you know people want to talk about sustainable farming sustainable agriculture you know what this is sustainable computing and and i don't think we've talked about that before nfts aren't aren't sustainable i I think i've laid out the case for that pretty well today if you want to be part of something sustainable be a part of our compose and with that we hope you enjoyed this episode of our compose cast thank you be safe And we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.